Hello everyone, welcome back to Humans of STEM Peers episode 5. Our guest for today is Dr. Rituparna Chakraborty. Currently, Rituparna is a science editor at iScience, a multidisciplinary research journal. She was the editor-in-chief of Club SciRai, an online magazine aiming at simplifying science for the public. Today, we will talk with Dr. Rituparna about interdisciplinary research, networking, SciComm during graduate studies and postdoc, and scientific editorial career options. Thank you, Rituparna, for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. You're welcome. So let's start by asking you uh, about your PhD studies. You completed your PhD in 2017. Can you tell us right. about your work uh, on ribbon synapse? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, amazing synapses to work with, the most wackiest one I have ever touched. Uh -huh. um, so um, uh, 2017, I defended January. So I submitted my thesis in 2016, December. Okay. Um, so I, I worked in this uh, ribbon synapses, which are uh, very peculiar synapses, not conventionally found in, in, uh, in the central nervous system. These are very characteristics of peripheral nervous system. And two prominent areas where you would find these synapses are the retina mm -hmm. and the hair cell. And what makes it very peculiar is that most of these cells are epithelial cells, okay. and uh, like in hair cells where I worked in, um, but they work as neuron. And these synapses are the ones which are instrumental in making it work as neuron. So okay. they have a very distinct active zone uh, where different protein partners interact with one another. Some okay. of them are very common uh, also in central nervous system, but okay. they have their signature proteins. Um, one of the protein that I was working specifically was otoferlin. Um, okay. um, it is it is known to cause uh, uh, deafness in human, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I was specifically looking at uh, one of the protein mutations in in otoferlin uh, uh, protein. It's a it's a gigantic protein. Okay. And, and has multiple C2 domains, so like structurally very complex protein. Yeah. And I was looking at a point mutation in one of these C2 domains. Um, and uh, what was happening is that uh, in human patients, when they have these mutations, yeah. uh, uh, we, have, we have seen that um, um, they, they go temporarily deaf whenever their body temperature would increase. <laughs> Okay. Um, so they are in general normal hearing people, yeah. but they were like specifically going deaf at that time okay. when the body temperature because of fever or any kind of physical activity was increasing. So that, that caught my eye and that's where my PhD project was. Um, so we created a mouse mutant um, okay. for to study this protein um, and, and to understand the neurophysiology and the structure yes. at the specific ribbon synapses because odopholin mm -hmm. was expressed in hair cells and to see the what is the impact of the mutation mm -hmm. in the physiology or the neurophysiology of these synapses. Okay. Um, that was more or less a scientific question behind it. Um, but technically, I'm an imaging scientist. So okay. all my work was very biophysics, structural work. Okay. Um, and I was trying to understand the 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 how how it was impacting the structure of the synapse and how the structure is finally correlating to the function uh, okay. functional loss at these synapses. Okay. So it was a huge collaborative project, um, okay. um, and uh, where I got the chance to collaborate with like computational biologist who was modeling these synapses yes. and these mutants. At the same time, the neurophysiologists who were doing the electrophysiological recordings and yeah. stuff, and and I was developing imaging modalities, and I was trying to see uh, uh, the the snapshot of a very very fast synapse in, yeah. in milliseconds and stuff okay. like that. Okay, that sounds really like a fascinating topic with a lot of disciplines combined together. Right, right. So as we right. talk about this, uh, what is being like an interdisciplinary researcher? How has oh, life changed? Um, 
Right. Um, I, 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 I have to confess that I actually know interdisciplinary. I don't know how structured okay. uh, uh, one silo's outlook works, to be very honest. Okay. I'm a, I'm, my background is trained bioengineer. I moved to optics and physics, and yes. then I moved to neuroscience in a biology lab. So. Yes. Um, so my background has been interdisciplinary yeah. and uh, so it has been great for me because um, one of my professors during my master's okay. at TIFR always used to say that, you know, my discipline is li leaving me yeah. um, when I'm at the edge of my breakthrough. So okay. when you need to expand your horizon and try to look at a problem from different outlook interdisciplinary yes. research is absolutely needed okay um, you have to talk to people who are coming with different expertise and background than yes. yours because um these kind of work or these kind of big projects cannot be looked into through one lens only yeah. And as as the science is evolving, and and we we are, let's take the example of COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, if we had only looked at COVID from epidemiology and virology aspect, we would not have had the vaccination that yes. we have right now. So we do have to expand when we are challenged with big problems. So that's for sure a great uh, place to be. Nonetheless, um, being a young interdisciplinary researcher can be very uh, difficult because you don't know where to start from, yeah. what to look at. Um, and one of the major challenges that comes in is like, where do I belong, right? <laughs> yes. uh, uh, am, I, am I a jack of all trades now? Like, um, so that kind of questions do come. And when you are collaborating with people, let's say I was collaborating a lot with uh, physicists, right? Uh -huh. And and when you are collaborating with them, you would you would realize that we totally speak completely different languages, yes. right? What the physicist might find like exciting and novel, uh, me being on the bit of a biology end would be like, eh, it's boring, right? <laughs> yes. And vice versa as yep. well. Uh, if I'm like crazy about this protein or the fur, and they would be like, eh, it doesn't do anything <laughs> yes. physically. So, so finding a common grounds could be quite challenging and, and finding, um, finding a way to sustain such projects, um, which is most of the time are not just located in a particular geography. Yes. They are global projects. It becomes quite, quite difficult, but I think a clear communication between multiple partners and, and, and clear objective of who yes. is doing what and how they are doing it yeah. definitely helps significantly in pushing the project further uh, okay. to reach the goal and, and, uh, and complete it in a given period of time. So how do you manage the communication between all these research groups? Because A cannot understand what right. B is doing, B cannot understand what C is doing. So you would be right. the common ground. So how did you manage that? I think this is an open-ended question. And I think COVID-19 has taught us how we yeah. did it uh, in a virtual space, right? Yes. So uh, uh, definitely virtual space helps a lot, right? So yeah. having set appointments, exactly. We will meet every Thursday, no matter what. Yeah. Even if the experiments didn't work, we have to know why it didn't work, okay. right? Yes. And um, so, as I said, clear communication, clear goals and objectives yes. of who is doing what and what uh -huh. the person is supposed to do. And if, if let's say, nobody in the team is capable of doing certain things, yes. uh, we have to be open to reach out to others, right? Yeah. Um, yes, it is challenging. Uh -huh. um, and and, and I, I was in Germany doing my PhD, right? Okay. So oftentimes my supervisor would say it's a book pilot, which means crash pilot. <laughs> uh, so uh, several times things have crashed, like literally crashed yes. on and, and, and it got backfired, mm -hmm. right? Um, because um, everybody's thinking about tangential ideas yes. at the same time. Yes. So having the core objective reminded and reiterated is very important. Yes. Of course, individuals can go later on 
extending yeah. projects wherever they want to, but mm-hmm. the core has to be very, very clear. Yeah. Um, having a good mentor helps yes. significantly um, because um, as a young interdisciplinary researchers, um, and especially for me, when I when I ha- I came from a very different background than my supervisor yes. was, and uh, the 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 flexibility and the space that I was given during my PhD mm-hmm. helped me a lot, right? Because yes. I was learning along the steps, so. right? And and I was gradually proceeding into the project, getting the taste of it, and also altering my ideas and my outlook in yes. this particular research area. So that that definitely yeah. helps a lot. No, good mentors are really important. And absolutely your career. absolutely i can go on and on <laughs> about mentors in my life for sure okay we can discuss that as well but my next question is about your postdoc i don't think right. you didn't do a postdoc and you transition no i did a postdoc okay. I did a postdoc. okay i must have missed it so how long was yeah. the postdoc so my postdoc was exactly two and a half years. Okay. Um, so I finished in 2017. 2017 itself, I jumped uh, to do my postdoc. As I said, right, that my PhD project opened a lot of avenues. Yes. Right? So, um, and there were publications that were waiting from yes. my PhD, which needed to be finished off at the same time. Um, I was trying to do something different than what I did in my PhD. Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to find my own niche that is distinct from my supervisor was. Um, So um, I I kind of hopped between Germany and US Mm -hmm. to finish my postdoc. And um, I I was uh, still working in ribbon synapses uh, for sure, but my question was completely different because I completely switched towards structural and very fast dynamics. Okay. So, um, I was not anymore bothered about any mutations. I was not bothered about any particular mm-hmm. deafness. I was mm-hmm. more bothered about how the neurotransmission happened in this uh, ribbon synapses. And uh, and if an uh, event, which is um, getting over within, let's say, six millisecond yeah. time, I wanted to capture that even in the highest possible resolution that exists. Yes. So that's that was the that was the aim of my postdoc, and and I had to develop again very fast imaging modalities, combine it with electron microscopy take a very commercial product that was available, um, yes. modify it completely to suit my system. Okay. And I did back and forth uh, between US and Germany. And and, and uh, finally, finally, the project come, came to a conclusion. Okay. Um, I, at the end of my first postdoc, I was actually not very prepared to leave my academic career because I was doing yes. quite good. And I, I really had this no, I'm going for another postdoc <laughs> for sure. Right, yes. I'm I'm there for myself, and let's apply for things and go more deep dive into yes. structural biology. Yeah. Uh, I I really got fascinated by that, and uh-huh. um, but life has uh, something else uh, yeah. for me, and I took the opportunity when it came. Huh. That sounds really great. So. Uh... During this time, I saw that you did a lot of freelancing work. So how did you manage the right. time? Because postdocs mm. uh, positions are really demanding. So how did you manage the time between your freelancing right. work and postdoc? Right, right, right. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say the two and a half years of my postdoc mm-hmm. was most uh, balanced work life. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um uh so that that's for sure yes. right that's i i, I will not uh, glorify it that okay. I, I i was perfectly within nine to five no i wasn't oh. so that was definitely yes. so my 24 hours extended to 48 hours every time <laughs> um uh but uh i think what was inherently in me and i i think uh, at the end of my phd when i was communicating with so many people mm-hmm. Um, I, I started to, you know, get the flavor that, you know, how important science communication was yes. and, and, and 
how much I love talking to people about yeah. my science. Okay, so every co-passenger in the airport was bugged by my ribbon sign up stories. Okay. They had no idea about it, and I'm not glorifying it. That was exactly how all my US trip flights were. Okay. Um, so um, I, I realized that that's a very nice question. That's, you know, that's a very nice um, yeah. thing. So when in 2007, when I was just, as I said, I was just defining what I would do for next, like in my postdoc, and yes. I switched immediately. Um, one of my very close friend and a senior, Somda Takarak, uh, she approached me somewhere in February and introduced uh -huh. me to 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 Stempels okay. and introduced me to Club Sairai. And yeah. she said, you know what? It's it could be a breeding ground. Just 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 do it. Okay. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, I'm still figuring it out. Yes. Um, let me go and try and do it. So my first project with Club Sairai was to launch uh, a newsletter. Okay. And uh, and the newsletter was very simple, right? It was basically uh, Stempius was growing mm -hmm. and growing in numbers and the team numbers. And a lot of information was out there from career to science to, yes. you know, uh, job outlets, new yeah. things happening. But it was on a Facebook platform. So there was no curated way of, you know, um, what happened in the last one week uh, that people can go and read again. Yes. So that was the idea and the genesis of the newsletter team. Mm -hmm. But I was not alone, as usual. Nothing happens alone. Yes. Um, I was I was really, really glad that I could have like four like-minded people okay. working with me and all of them from STEM peers again. Yeah. And we, we managed and we managed to create that platform where it was, I think, in the beginning, only 25 people were uh -huh. reading that. And um, by the end of it, it was, I mean, it's still continuing great work by Tonmoy and team. Um, and it's, 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 it's amazing and yep. uh, how it grew and people really appreciated that. So that kind of gave me a like, uh-huh, that's <laughs> nice. It's like a reward yes. system. Like yes. if you give me a toffee, I will do it for you. Yep. Later on, Anundo and Abhinav came uh, okay. to me and they was like, you know, Club Saira is there. Do you want to uh, start contributing? So I started yes. contributing, like writing. I never, I'm not a great writer, mm -hmm. but I'm very good at getting like small key messages of okay. significance of the study very fast, right? So um, I, I started experimenting with writing, yeah. with blogging and stuff, mm -hmm. and slowly came to the role of uh, the editor-in-chief of Club oh, okay. where my primary focus were more of like outreach, where do I take this platform to, mm -hmm. who are the best candidates uh, who can write for right us, for who us. are the best editors who can take the, the key message and simplify it to even my grandmom if yes. requires to, right? Yeah. So... That was really, really um, exciting. So I think, you know, um, even when it was, let's say, a very hard day at lab, yep. because let's say my experiments all crashed, all the imaging didn't work. Yes. It is still rewarding to sit at, let's say, 11 o'clock at night and finish certain aspect of it and, and, and be on time to deliver that. So it's okay. it, it was more like a, reward-based system created the the network that i needed right like yes. it, it was almost becoming like my support system that mm -hmm. you know oh experiments didn't work great oh, but what let me go and do something in club right? yes. so that kind of thing so we can say that uh, this set up your base of becoming a scientific editor later in your career this experience right right um i mean uh, full disclaimer to become a scientific editor uh one needs to be a good scientist mm -hmm. first and foremost right uh you do not need a science communication <clears throat> background i i was lucky to get this yeah. uh, opportunity that came in but you do not have to be a great science communicator you need to be somebody who understands science very fast can switch from field A to field B yeah. in a next paper and then take a call within 15 minutes. Okay. Good first, take a call, yeah. right? Um, take a call. Um, so that's that's very, very important. And, and, and that's exactly where, you know, you... But what, what Club Saira did 
to me was of course i honed this editorial skills a bit yes. but what club side did to me was it gave me the opportunity to work with a big team so i okay. when i was editor in chief i was uh, overwing like 14 editors at seven different time zones okay so um so when you start working with team it's not your way always it's mm-hmm. their way as mm-hmm. well right yeah. so that communication line it opened yes. it gave me the 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 confidence of you know interacting with people and 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 finding what's the best, best. possible thing for a whole like you know so everybody is happy yes. everybody is on the same page everybody can work together and and yet enjoy the process right so yes. that was that was the biggest skill set that and um, when i was evaluated for i science um that was the thing that they were asking me because um they were impressed by the fact that i i I came as an editor in chief mm-hmm. where the readership of Club Sara was quite small yes. but within within a span of 8 to 9 months it was somewhere in 70000 yeah so this this is a great job and i science was a new journal that yes. time so it was just launched in 2018 our 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 key responsibilities are of course being an editor of an interdisciplinary journal mm-hmm. and we we care about the science but it was also to create our name yes in community where people trust you yes as as the the leaders right and and they trust you they trust their work with us and they know that uh this platform will help them to reach more people yes. so that that was the main thing and so it's a mix of all good science mm-hmm. good science okay. communication so what science communication activities can people do during the phd or postdoc right it depends on person's interest mm-hmm. right so there are a lot um, i i think uh so for me uh one of the easiest way to check is of course like check platforms like club sara mass of yeah. science and yours as well right yeah. um so check out these platforms reach out to the people and see if there is a space that they can accommodate a contribution yes i i realize that it uh it only you only learn about science communication when you do it right. so there is no like mixed thera- like there is not fixed therapy yes. which will say if you do these and these things you will be a great science communicator no yep. so you you learn along the process so mm-hmm. these platforms are great platforms to look out for yep. um your university press release offices are great platforms as well so um if you think that you have time and you, you could go and talk to them and say that hey guys what do you guys do i mean yes. there is no harm right yes. so go and check that funding bodies have uh uh, uh different press offices as well mm-hmm. so you can talk to them um you can also check the publishing houses for example um where not just the core editorial scientific editorial side they also have a very strong press release so okay. it's kind of depends on what the person okay. wants to do the person wants to be closer to the science uh, and 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 be a scientific editor yes or if the person wants to be a more of a science communicator with variable outlets yes. out there you could be an illustrator you could be a press office things yeah. like that so it's and and as i said you might not know it when you start it so try different things out and and once you start doing it you would be more like okay yeah these are the things i like these are yes. the things i don't like so that helps okay those are really useful tips and uh, so that brings to my next question about network building how did you build your networking yeah. skills and network and what are the key factors that one should keep in mind when building a network or starting to build a network right Oh my god this is this is a very difficult question i'm still learning honestly um i think one of my biggest strength was yeah. i can talk to anybody okay yes. so it i it doesn't matter um uh, i can talk to a bartender <laughs> about my science or as i said i can talk to a farmer in a plain about yes. my science right so um i never did a very structured networking honestly so i didn't network with people because i needed a job okay i i i networked with people uh, where i thought that their profile is interesting for me and 
I I can learn something from them. This yes. is this is my honest opinion, and that can come from anybody, literally anybody. Um, so <coughs> others' stories inspired me, mm-hmm. and uh, of course, their life is not exactly textbook for me, but. I get to learn a lot of things. So that was my way of reaching out and and start talking to people. Um I did network a lot during conferences okay. and that was not because I wanted to publish my paper in all the big three journals but it was more like um tell me what you are looking for in a paper, right? Yes. Like if I am talking to an editor in chief of a particular journal yes. uh, during uh, during a conference, I would be asking like hey guys, I mean I have this paper which is almost out of the oven. Can you tell me what you guys are looking for, mm-hmm. right? Like, so that helps you to you know navigate your thought process a bit yeah. according to the need. Um so yeah, conferences are great. Uh I I was glad that I was in Göttingen because Göttingen is like the hub of neuroscience where I was in uh, it has all the prime institutes of Germany there yes. so it's a very small geographical location um it had everything that you wanted okay. that also has its disadvantage yeah. because so close that you practically don't realize that you were actually collaborating and networking with yes. people so you know it doesn't have to be gigantic conferences it could be a small lab meeting where yes. you talk with people and understand where they got the idea from or or to understand what they have done to reach this goal so yeah. small local cup pub, pub crawls could or be okay. uh, uh, could be a great great opportunity to network and okay. Yeah, but yeah, as I said, I I never network with a single person with an objective that they will give me a job. Uh, yeah. I was just at the right time and and was open to to what they have to say. Yes. So this could be considered as more of informational interviews that you did. Right. Without an right. objective of getting a job in their company. So Right. Yeah. Like before I moved to Cypress, I think I have spoken to every damn journal that existed on this planet earth okay. uh editor chiefs and publishers i also spoke a lot to different newspapers okay and okay? like i was like oh what do you guys write can you just tell me what you guys are writing so that definitely helped me a bit um yeah. but i never i i think i never ever asked anybody that can you get me a job yes uh, or will you recommend my name uh, uh if i apply to this uh position. this position um in my experience it it happened a bit differently um okay. i since they knew me yes uh, already um they were more like hey by the way fii uh, so and so is opening a position go ahead and apply yeah so that's so what that happened so that works yeah so building a relationship is really important that is what i would absolutely. say absolutely and i am so thankful for this relationships yeah. like i mean um i i i'm still in touch with every one of them and i i do do small things right yeah. like let's let's have a chat with you again or if if everything goes good let's have a beer together yes. so helps that that network helps so okay definitely. so uh, out of curiosity what is the difference between scientific editor and editor in chief ooh <laughs> very fancy uh, <laughs> so it's a um editor in chief is the lead editor okay. so he she is the one who is taking care of the entire journal okay. right um by training they are also scientific editors but mm-hmm. they are also responsible for taking care of the journal budget journal okay. outlooks and things like that they they are a bit senior in position okay. so it's a gradual career trajectory you start okay. an assistant you go associate senior and then chief editor okay so scientific editor is like um for me since i just moved out of postdoc uh, immediately so that's where i started and 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 that's that the trajectory i would probably go okay so do you have any advice for people who want to transition into this field of scientific editing what should they do and what sh- they shouldn't do as right well? right right um um i can speak from my experience yeah. like um I, in our team uh we have we have like people from almost every walk of science like we have 
publishers turn to editors. We have yes. like immediate PhD graduate coming into the team. They have worked in companies and then they moved into. So um, for a scientific editor, I think one most, most crucial thing that you really need to know is that have your specialization. Yes. Be great in your specialization. Be a be the best that you can be. And I think every PhD at postdoc are very strong yes. in what they do. Yes. But have a bird's eye overview of what's happening around you. Yeah. So that's always a bit difficult because mm-hmm. especially at the postdoc stage, because you know, you become so focused in your own work that you you lose the broader picture of yes. things happening. Okay. So, um, you know, read things which are outside your scope, mm-hmm. read things which are reading is important, very yes. honestly speaking, um, read things which are a bit outside your expertise or talk to uh, go to lab meetings, for example, or the institutional meetings, which is like, if you're a biologist, go to a physics meeting, or yeah. if you are a chemist, go to a biologist meeting, right? So just just to get a flavor of what people are doing, how the fields are going yes. on. So that helps. And that, that is not just to know people, that is more like to see how flexible you are to move from mm-hmm. one field to another yeah. and and to see if you have you are passionate about science yes. in general, right? So this is definitely read broadly, read read in depth, but read broadly as well. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, I think what helps a lot is that um if you have a good time management skill and you know how yeah. to prioritize things because in scientific editor job you are always under time pressure uh-huh. right because you have to give decision to your authors yes. at some point right and in a short period of time yeah. so um you need to be need to be able to prioritize that, okay, this is important, this is not so important, it can wait a bit. Okay. Let me focus on this, let, let me give my all attention on this, uh-huh. and let me finish this project, and then I will jump into it. Okay. Um, and third most important skill is be diplomatic, uh-huh. which is uh, because uh, as editors, we have to give sometimes bad news, yeah. right? And we do not want to, trust of me. We, none <laughs> of us want to. We hate sending that letter, right? Uh, but we have to. Yeah. And and But we do not want to burn the bridges with the authors. We, we will never or, or yeah. be disrespectful towards our reviewers, right? Because this is the community we care about. Um, so be diplomatic, uh, be, be a bit diplomatic in terms of whom you are talking to and how you are talking to and, yeah. and, and be flexible. Okay. That's for sure. So, and, but these are the skills that you learn, learn. in the job as well. And yeah. these are the skills that are also there and you can develop okay. it during your PhDs and post yes. Um, I, I am learning very, very hard time. And I think this is one of the biggest thing that is different for me from my postdoc years to to mm-hmm. to my scientific guide is um uh not to dive too deep in the sense like you know we have this thing when we are postdoc we love to troubleshoot stuff yes. right oh it didn't work in this way let me try another way yeah. it didn't work that way then it will happen another way um so there are there are times when you have to be like, let it be, yep. let it go. You know, you have tried everything that you could, yes. but it's time for you to let it go. So yep. you, these are the requirements that you need to fulfill. Okay. Uh, convey the message that you want to convey. Yep. And if the person is interested, interested in it and want to pursue it further, he or she will come back to you. Okay. You will be able to help. So, but let it go. There are yes. times because there are time crunches. There are deadlines that yeah. we have to meet. So if we get stuck up on one project, then, then that might be a pet project for sure. Every one of us have it, yes. right? But there's a there's a limit of it. And I think that's a massive difference <laughs> when you think about from being in academia or when you are in a, let's say, in a corporate mm-hmm. publishing. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts and sharing your guidance today it was really wonderful to talk to you and learn more about scientific editing thank you so much